brothers and sisters, grace and peace are yours this day. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. One needs to be careful in life. A couple weeks ago, Pastor Dom humbly requested that he switch weekend with me for preaching. I didn't look at the text. I could have. This is not one of those lessons that you get done reading and you say the gospel of our Lord and fully feel that this is in fact the gospel. It is a difficult lesson. So as I was looking about trying to find some gospel, some approach to this text to build up the body of Christ, my attention fell, as it has probably for many of us during these last weeks, to the Olympics in Rio. Many of you have been watching them or talking about them or interacting about them on social media, maybe a little bit of all of those things. And there's a good bit of excitement, as there always is when the Olympics come around. I've watched bits and pieces of it on the internet, and because of a certain individual who happens to have an office next to my mine, I've actually watched fencing for the first time for some strange reason. It's a curious sport. Um, but there is drama in the first quarter in many of these events it unfold over these last weeks. Even if you haven't watched the Olympics, you have likely heard about some of the stories. And, in, and it happens every single time the Olympics come around. It seems to be one of those things that's just always there. But I have noticed something in recent years, that the Olympics are not quite what I grew up with. They're not quite what they used to be. Now don't get me wrong, the athletes and their stories are as fascinating as always. Their skills, techniques, and some of the unique life situations they come from are nothing short of mind-boggling. So, I struggled with what was missing from the Olympics. And I think I figured it out. It's the bad guys. Short of a Frenchman talking smack to Michael Phelps, there are a few good guy, bad guy scenarios played out in the Olympics. Now, when I was a kid, at the height of the Cold War, there was absolutely no question who the bad guys were, all right? Not at all. It was those Ruskies, those Soviets, all those Eastern Bloc countries. You knew they were bad news, and you rooted against them at every possible turn, except for maybe Olga Corbett and Nadia Comaneci, just because they were so wonderful at what they did. And they were kind of cute, and I was a teenage boy, for Pete's sake. So there you go. Um, even if they were commies, they were all right. You know, so you kind of put those things aside. But... While the athletes were often maybe even likable, and some of the skills that they portrayed were wonderful, and their passion for the sport to be commended, it was actually the judges from those countries that we really detected. It was always that one judge from Romania, or that one judge from, from Soviet Union that would, would vote way lower than all the rest of the judges on a particular skill set, whether it be gymnastics, or whether it be ice skating, or something like that. And it always seemed that those judges were out to get us. Or at least that's the way it, was seen, it seemed, or the media kind of portrayed things. But if you've ever so much as refereed a church league softball game, you know that judging can, in fact, be difficult. It's a tricky thing, but it is something that we do all the time. Pastor John Orford told this story in one of his recent books. He talked about a man who was being tailgated by a woman who was evidently in a hurry to get someplace. And he comes to an intersection, and when the light turns yellow, he hits the brakes and slows down, because, quite honestly, that's what you're supposed to do. And he stops at the intersection, and the woman behind him goes absolutely ballistic. She honks her horn at him. She yells at her frustration in no uncertain terms. She rants and raves and gestures, and then, while she's in mid-rant, she hears a tap on her window, and there she sees a policeman. He invites her out of her car and takes her to the station where she is searched and fingerprinted and put in a cell. After a couple of hours, she is released and the arresting officer gives her back her personal effects saying, I'm terribly sorry for the mistake. It was a mistake, ma'am. I pulled up behind your car while you're blowing your horn using bad gestures and saying bad words and I noticed your What Would Jesus Do bumper sticker. And then I saw your Choose Life license plate holder. And then I saw the follow me to Sunday school window sign and the fish emblem on your trunk. And I naturally assumed that you had stolen the car. There's an old line that says, if the 
being Christian were illegal, would there be enough evidence in your life to convict you? And it's an interesting conversation and a good question. But it, this idea of judging can still make us feel uncomfortable. And they say that ignorance is bliss, but I'm not quite so sure that's true. And I'm even less sure that being judged should always be seen in the negative. Here's the thing. There is not one participant in the Olympic Games that has not and continues to be judged. From Simone Manuel to Michael Phelps before they first put on their goggles, or Simone Biles or Allie Rainsman, whatever before they ever did their first somersault, they were judged. They were timed, their flaws were critiqued, their skills that they couldn't quite nail were pointed out to them, and I'm sure there were times that they were often devastated, that they felt that it was unfair, that the people may have been picking on them. But then, then, after much practice and effort and more judging, then, then came the time cut. Eventually the four exercises became flawless, even in the Olympics, they are still judged. But it just happens to be, in these cases, they are judged to be the best in the world. I think I'm on safe ground here when I say that none of us, though, really likes being judged. If we did, maybe more of us would be Olympic caliber athletes. I can't tell you that for a fact, but maybe. But I can make this blanket statement because when I read the Gospel today and then I heard your response to it, I could feel your reaction. I could feel it because I, too, know that feeling. Do you think that I have come to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, rather division. From now on, five and one household will be divided. Awkward. This is not the Jesus I like to hear from. Whatever happened to the loving Jesus, the soft and tender Savior? Where is the one that we know is wonderful counselor, mighty God? How does all of this fit into his plan for his life that was sung by the angels? Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. There, in these words, is the gentle Jesus so prevalent in the Gospel of Luke. Don't worry. It's still there. You see, we so like the thought of judgment that we automatically equate it with the negative. But as we have seen, it is not. And the same holds true for our Gospel lesson for today. On first blush, it may not seem like good news. But dig a little deeper. And we will imply, in fact find that it is good. We don't know what Jesus' tone of voice was when he spoke these words. But we do know that he was under some pressure. I have a baptism with which to be baptized. And what stress I am under until it is completed. Jesus knew this stress. He had a job to do. Remember earlier when he mentioned that Jesus had set his face to Jerusalem a couple weeks back? Pastor Dom pointed this out. Everything that he has done in Luke's gospel from that point on was with the end in mind. And that end has a cross standing there. Jesus will be judged unfairly. And the result will be his death. A negative, if I've ever heard one. But like the dramatic stories of the Olympic athletes, this is not the end of his story. And we go back to the very beginning of our lesson today. Jesus says, I came to bring fire to the earth and how I wish it will already kindle. Oh, fire. Again, fire is bad, right? Fire is associated with you know where. Well, yes, I mean, on second thought, maybe fire isn't quite so bad. In the, we've got the book of Acts that Luke also writes, he talks about the gift of the Holy Spirit coming down as tongues of fire on the, on the apostles. Fire is oftentimes a very good thing. It keeps us warm and lets us cook our food. Fire indeed can be very, very good. And in fact, fire is one of the purifying forces that's talked about frequently in Scripture. Fire is used to refine, to make pure. And I think that's where Jesus is headed with this. The quality of his life, when set over against ours, is a call to judgment. Because our lives will fall far short of his. And when we follow him with divine, uh, putting him first in our lives, the division sometimes comes naturally because the forces of evil in this world will not give up easily. But it is easy for us to judge against others. And this is sometimes where we get into a trap. You see, when we watch things like the Olympics, some of these athletes are so good, they make it seem so simple. 
And then you're sitting there on your sofa with a bag of chips and, you know, and, and, and you know, and, you know, something from the Glarus Brewery or something. And, and, and you're watching those poor Filipino divers who seem to suddenly forget how to dive once they jumped off the board and end up splashing horrendously into the water. And you can laugh at them. Or you laugh at that poor pole vaulter who's seemingly some country you've never, ever heard of before. And he can't even make it over the bar for the entry height. He actually goes under the bar, which is not how you do pole vaulting, all right? And you can laugh at them. Or, or we get to the point where we critique the performances of our favorites who fall short and get upset when our soccer team can't even eat a bunch of sweets. But our judgment is tainted. We don't have the proper qualifications to judge those people adequately. Comic Bill Murray tweeted, Every Olympic event should include one average person competing for reference. And I think he's on to something there. I mean, seriously, have you ever tried doing a double twist with a somersault off of a diving board before? Shoot, I can barely get off the diving board for Pete's sake. Tony does a better job than I do, all right? All right? And then you have Usain Bolt. I mean, he could give me a, a, in a 100 meter dash, he could give me a 90 meter lead, and he would still win. All right? And then there's the uneven bars. Are you kidding me? You see what those girls do? Those things happen. Sometimes we speak of Christ as our example of how we should live and are accused of making Christianity into a new law, a religion of good works. But if we really think of Christ as our pattern or example, we are soon driven to realize that all, like all law, we are in desperate need of a Savior. We are in desperate need of forgiveness and grace because compared to Him, we come off Yet this is what the author of our New Testament lesson from Hebrews was talking about when he talked about running the race. A life of faith is not a perfectly lived one, but one where we have, or one where we have the right bumper stickers on our cars, but rather one that is a constant act of becoming. It is not a series of sprints, but rather it is an endurance race, an ongoing process. C.S. Lewis once said that the gospel was concerned to create new people, not just nice people. The human need is an inner transformation that makes us into new creatures. It is the warmth of the Spirit of Christ that accomplishes this. This is not something that we can do for ourselves. The New Testament insistence upon grace as a gift, not work or merit. We cannot make ourselves into the sort of persons who are recognizable as the sons and daughters of God, no matter how hard we train. The heart of Christianity says this clearly. Jesus longs for the fires that will mark the end of his mission, that day when the training is done and the judgment comes and we are found not in tip-top shape, but fully trusting in his word, in our promises that were given to us in baptism, which give us life in his name. Until that time comes, though, there is a race to be run. There are lives to be lived and love to be shared, even as we know in faith. We've already won that race in God's hands. Would you pray with me? Holy and merciful God, Jesus tells us to know what time it is, but the truth is we are half asleep, unaware of the urgency of your call, oblivious to the haste of your return, ignorant of the pressing need to make our time count. We absentmindedly walk through our days, trusting in ourselves, our own ability, our self justification and our self-righteousness, deluded into thinking that we are in control. Be with us in the midst of our judging others and our piety, even though we are sure there's time to deal with you later. Purify us with your fire so that we may live for you and in you, and in so doing, bring life to all your